Welcome to this SOAS ACE webinar titled Making Anti-Corruption Messaging Effective – The Critical Importance of Feasibility and Targeting. Today's speakers are Karen Pfeiffer of the University of Bristol, Lena Coney Hoffman of Chatham House and Heather Marquette and Nick Cheeseman, both of the University of Birmingham. Today's session will be moderated by Pallavi Roy, who is the Joint Research Director for the SOAS Anti-Corruption Evidence Programme. And I'll, with that, I'll hand over to Pallavi now. Now, there seems to be some consensus on understanding the causes and costs of corruption, but little exists on how to effectively address and, and reduce it. Uh, so the SOAS-ACE program, SOAS University of London and Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, is part of a much larger consortium. There is global integrity. Uh, there is a senior and organized crime uh, bit of ACE, which is headed by Heather Market and about to launch. So, so we're a big family, a rather large umbrella. Uh, this webinar is, is organized by researchers who are part of the SOAS-ACE program, the Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. It is an innovative anti-corruption pr uh, program that adds to this discussion of what makes for effective anti-corruption policy design. And it's funded by the UK government, works across uh, uh, Asia and Africa. And the starting point of the SOAS ACE program is that we don't take as a given that enforcement starts from above, that someone is watching and as soon as a rule is broken, the relevant authority will just sweep in and will take corrective measures. And, and we know that one of the most important reasons why corruption persists is that there is an enforcement deficit. You know, even where very elegantly designed rules exist, set to some kind of normative benchmark, desired normative benchmark, uh, enforcement can leave much to be desired particularly if many or most in that community do not want enforcement. So rules are broken because in the vast majority of cases, it's not in the interest of that community to stick to the rules. It's not just about that big, bad, politically connected guy, big corporation, big political party, big man uh, who wants to break rules just because he or she can. In many cases, the community or the members of community break rules simply because they don't have an option. That's the only way they have to solve some problems that they are facing. And rule breaking just becomes necessary behavior because they don't have another choice. And more importantly, being rule following is of no help to them. You know, sticking to rules isn't usually going to help if that emergency hospital admission requires one to pay a bribe. That makes it what we call a very adverse context. The incentive for community to be rule following is just not there. It's not only a few bad apples who are breaking, breaking the rules. There is a societal issue over here. So, so as we describe it, this is the adverse context of designing in which one has to design anti-corruption policy. If there's little incentive for most people in society to uphold rules, what then makes for effective anti-corruption? And this is what we call where enforcement or horizontal enforcement matters, not just enforcement, but horizontal enforcement matters and that rules are upheld in self-interest. It's not top-down, it's not vertical, but it's horizontal where I'll uphold a rule and my peer will uphold the rule and I can check that the peer is upholding rules because it's in my self-interest to do so. But millions have been spent by private and public donors to change, uh, uh, you know, private and public donors to change community opinion about corruption. When the reality is that unless incentives are changed, shaping or shifting, rather shifting opinions, not so much shaping, you can shape opinions, but you need to shift opinions, will actually do very little. And one of the most popular tools in this effort has been generalized messaging about corruption, that corruption is bad and that corruption can hurt society. And that's essentially what this, this uh, you know, conversation uh, seminar is about today. Because research conducted in Lagos by SOASIS, and the authors of that paper are very much part of this panel, has reinforced an emerging and very, very important strand of uh, research in anti-corruption, that if targeted messaging addresses specific problems, the chances of a positive outcome are higher, but there's one even more important bit of messaging, we think, and uh, that significant co uh, contribution is that generalized messaging can actually prime or even sort of motivate citizens to overemphasize the role of corruption in their lives and can result in, in what is called corruption fatigue. So our other panelists too have been working in parallel on very, very similar issues dealing with corruption that has become socially entrenched in some contexts, whether in the context of functional corruption or looking at it through the lens of social norms or in issues of enforcement and anti-government, uh, in, in uh, uh, enforcement of anti-corruption across governance agencies. Now this work 
also, luckily, fits very nicely with the SOAS ACE framework that states that there must be targeted players within the specific sector who want to implement relevant changes in policy, and this is important, and have the capacity to do so if the appropriate policy and messaging is in place, and that's very important. Players who want to enforce change and players who have the capacity to enforce change. These two coming together is extremely important for us. To put it another way, our framework states that anti-corruption is more likely where actors are interested in following rules, specific rules, have the power to monitor peers and take them to task if they are actually breaking the rules. So the difference in this approach is that we are also devising strategies for horizontal enforcement while accepting and agreeing that vertical enforcement is as important. So, so we're also parallelly devising strategies for horizontal approach. So we need to talk, we need to ask about who will support the policy, who will enforce it, who will implement it. If there are no clear answers to who will enforce, messaging is unlikely to help. So we're therefore looking at a number of interdependent factors like effective messaging, like what is feasible messaging, feasible policy? What does that mean for anti-corruption policy making? What are the incentives that we are looking to restructure? And in the context of this very adverse context where uh, you know, there seems to be a corruption equilibrium. So the conversation today is essentially about how these two will interact. So what we hope to explore today are answers to two uh, questions that vex every, uh, you know, everyone in, in the policy design world, the so what and the how to. You know, given who our uh, panelists are, they are best placed to have this conversation. And I have absolutely no doubt we will walk away with some very thought-provoking answers to these questions in the end. And it's time I introduce them. Uh, we have uh, uh, Karen Pfeiffer, Dr. Karen Pfeiffer, who will, who will uh, begin uh, uh, the conversation. Uh, Dr. Karen Pfeiffer is Senior Lecturer of International Public Policy and Governance at the School for Policy Studies, University of Bristol, UK. Her research mostly focuses on the causes and consequences of corruption and the unintended impacts of anti-corruption policy. Karen has conducted research in several different countries, and most recently in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Uganda, South Africa, and Nigeria. She's one of the co-authors of the paper that I was just referring to. Her research has been published in esteemed journals like the British Journal of Political Science, Governance, and World Development. She regularly advises Transparency International and has worked with the World Bank, the UNDP, OECD, FCDO, the Development Leadership Program, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the German Development Agency, GIZ, on anti-corruption policy and analysis. Our next panelist is Dr. Lena Foni Hoffman. Lena is an Associate Fellow of the African Program at Chatham House and Lead Researcher for the Program Social Norms and Accountable Governance Project. She's an Honorary Senior Fellow of the Global Evergreening Alliance Lena researches and writes on informal institutions, politics, governance, corruption, food security, and regional trade in West Africa. Some of our work dovetails very neatly with, uh, with the work we're doing in, in ACE because we're all looking at how incentives uh, can be changed in context of very embedded corruption. She was a technical advisor to the Permanent Interstate Committee for Drought Control in the Sahel from 2016 to 2020. She was also a Marie Curie Research Fellow at the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research and an anti-corruption investigator in Nigeria's Independent Commission for Corrupt Practices, more popularly known as the ICPC. We then have with us Heather Market. Heather is Professor of Development Politics at the University of Birmingham, UK, and is currently seconded part-time to SCDO's Research and Evidence Division as Senior Research Fellow, Governance and Conflict. Heather's research, which has been funded by the British Academy, Global Challenges Research Fund, DFID, Australian DFAT, and the EU focuses on corruption and anti-corruption interventions, development politics, aid and foreign policy, and increasingly transnational organized crime. Heather is leading a new component of ACE, uh, I, I'd referred to this in the beginning, focused on serious organized crime, transnational corruption, illicit finance and kleptocracy, known as SOCA, SOC ACE, and with a website launching soon. So do keep a lookout for that one. Uh, our other panelist, final panelist is Nick Cheeseman. Nick is professor of democracy at the University of Birmingham, UK, UK and was formerly the director of the African Studies Center at the University of Oxford. He mainly works in democracy, elections and development and has published research in Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Nick is the author or editor of more than 10 books on democracy and political institutions in Africa. He was awarded the Joni Lovendusky Prize for Outstanding Professional Achievement by a mid-career scholar in 2019 by the Politics, Political Studies Association of the United Kingdom. 
in the same year, his efforts to promote a better understanding of democracy and how it can be protected and strengthened won the Celebrating Impact Prize of the Economic and Social Research Council for Outstanding International Impact. He's a frequent commentator on African and global events and makes analysis regular features across leading global media platforms. We had another panelist with us, Idayat Hassan. Now, unfortunately, Idayat, who is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development in Nigeria and one of the partners of SOSACE and has also worked extensively with the other panelists, she's known for her excellent work on, on corruption, anti-corruption and governance, especially of, of Nigeria's anti-corruption agencies. She would have been a fitting fifth person to complete this panel and be a part of this conversation. Unfortunately, she's in Sokoto with very, very bad internet coverage, so she really can't make it. I mean, I can't even get my WhatsApp messages through to her. So that won't be joining us, but she was supposed to be the fifth panel. But over to the panel now, starting with Karen. Thank you. Karen, over to you. Thanks very much to everyone who organized this and for putting this together. Um, I was thinking about you know, looking at the panelists and thinking about what could be, what would I, um, what would be the best contribution I could make to this discussion, especially at the beginning. And I thought without presenting research or anything like that, it might do us well to talk first about sort of um, what the evidence says. So the, the kind of motivating question I have here is when can messaging change incentives sufficiently on its own? And when are parallel policy changes required to link messaging with feasible strategies? It's a really complex question. And I think it requires us knowing what, what the evidence has said about messaging so far. Um, so I thought maybe I could first give a really quick whistle to stop tour through what, what's been done. So the motivation between, behind these studies is that as you said, these, these awareness raising campaigns are already occurring around the world. With various partners, I've conducted three messaging studies so far. And in those, I've tested 14 different types of messages in three different countries. So we've most recently worked together, Nick and I, on Nigeria, but I've also done this in um, a similar study in Papua New Guinea and in Jakarta. Um, and Aside from that, there's also been a few other, other scholars who have led these types of messaging studies. So it's a growing kind of bubbling um, research agenda. If you take all the results together, um, it's only one message that's been tested so far that has seemingly had the intended impact. So one awareness raising message about corruption has seemingly um, influence people to um, think about corruption or even anti-corruption in the way we would hope it would if we thought that awareness raising could be an effective tool in anti-corruption. And that one message um, was in Papua New Guinea, and it, it suggested that when you um, discuss corruption as being a local issue that impacts local communities, it might encourage people to think more positively about reporting corruption. Um, so I think we just need to keep that in mind. Nick and I study uh, kind of goes further and, and has some worrying, but also some complex findings in there. So the worrying bit is that four out of the five messages we tested actually work to encourage people to pay a bribe in a game that we designed on a tablet. So it's a bribery game. Um, but if we split the sample up a bit, it seemed um, that it's actually that kind of negative impact is um, most pronounced in those who were already worried about the size of the problem, those who were less uh, pessimistic about um, corruption being extremely widespread in the society, we found there that there was one message, so a message about linking corruption to taxes and tax payment, um, that that uh, discouraged bribery in our game. So th there's kind of glimmers of hope is what I want to emphasize. Um, but lots of things have been tested. So this isn't just about raising awareness to the issue of corruption being widespread. Some of these messages that have been tested, which have had negative impacts in research, have taken other tones. One, for example, 
um, encouraged, only encouraged people to get involved in this anti-corruption civic response. It's, it's said it, now more than ever, it's easy to join anti-corruption organizations or to fight against corruption. Here's a phone number where you can report corruption and so on. There was another message in Jakarta that was tested, which emphasized the successes that the government had in fighting corruption. So the idea there is maybe if we put a positive spin on it, it won't have such a negative impact. Um, but both of those sort of neutral or positively toned messages did have the same backfiring effect. And what we think has, is happening with respect to this backfire, some messages are even when we don't intend them to, but they're reminding people that corruption is widespread. And so it's triggering that corruption fatigue that Pallavi talked about. It's, it's making potentially people think that the, the problem is too big to fight. And so instead of resisting it, I mean, in what Nick and I found, it may be encouraging people to go with the grain. So it's really challenging to think about um, the, the question posed, you know, whether or not, when can messaging change incentives sufficiently based on that evidence base? I mean, quite frankly, the evidence so far doesn't really let us ask the question or um, answer the question. Um, we don't know about how different policy environments, for example, might impact on the efficacy of messaging strategies because the literature is still really small. It hasn't been tested in that many countries or in different types of contexts. Um, there are some hypotheses that would be great to test going forward. For example, you know, to really examine whether or not people believe that the government has any sort of credibility in fighting corruption. Maybe in that context, certain types of messages might work. But I think for me, the bottom line, uh, and any time I've talked about this body of work, it's it, the, the sort of like take home point is always that at this point, what we know is that messaging strategies need to be tested um, before they're deployed in, in any sort of big scale. Um, and that's our best chance of, you know, avoiding doing more harm than good with them. No, I'll pass it over. It's okay. Fascinating. So, so you're, I think I think that that's also what one gets from your your paper, Karen, with me, which is that messaging strategies need to be tested. We've had a lot of donor money going in. We need to do some small small scale testing. Uh, you know, the policy background matters. And I think what one important fact that I picked up from from what you said is that the policy background matters because we we need to connect this this uh, this insight to creating sectoral in incentives for horizontal support. If that's the policy uh, background, well, when, how can messaging dovetail? And you've made two very important points, which I think we can pick up on uh, during the second half of the conversation. So I'm, I'm going to take that as, uh, as, as you know, conclusions from, from your, your intervention here. Next up with us is Lena. Lena, you're on next. Uh, thank you, Pallavi, and uh, thank you, Karen, for, uh, thank you, Pallavi, first of all, for setting the scene. Um, thank you, Karen, for just ending on that note about testing messaging strategies. And I think it's really great that um, that's kind of the line um, I would like to thread through um, what I'll be speaking about, just responding to that first question of when um, can messaging change incentives sufficiently on its on their own or its own, and when are parallel uh, policy changes uh, required to link messaging with feasibility strategies. So I'll speak a bit about um, the work that we have done on the Social Norms and Accountable Governance uh, project with Chatham House. Um, I think it's, I think our inception or the time that we've been doing this work is around about the same, around about the same five to six years period of ACE. So we've kind of been in the same environment and looking at the same phenomena from different sides. Um, the specific side that we've been working, we've been looking at the phenomena of corruption on um, the SNAG project is looking at corruption as this collective practice. 
um, and really trying to understand um, the social expectations, the social dynamics of this practice, what are the contexts or the conditions that allow for corruption to be normalized? Um, what are the inf social influences um, um, that people are subject to when they are in an environment where they have to make a decision to either, for example, give a bribe or not? So I think the, the simple answer to if um, messaging strategies can work on their own, as Karen said, is no. Um, messages have to take into consideration the environment in which they're introduced, the kinds of uh, um, forms of corruption that are normalized or people are desensitized to in that environment, um, the kinds of corruption that people are apathetic to, and the ones that, um, and I think I'll, I'll speak, uh, I'll introduce kind of this point and then thread it through when, I, when we come back um, the next round, um, the kinds of corruption that people are mistaken about the beliefs of others about. And that's really quite one of the very interesting findings that we um, have uncovered in our work. We've done two rounds of um, a national household survey in Nigeria, looking at different corrupt behaviors. You could group these behaviors under bribery, embezzlement, and electoral fraud. And we really wanted to test the kinds of assumptions, first of all, the assumptions people had about the behaviors. And we also wanted to test um, people's expectations about what people do in those kinds of circumstances or those kinds of, those kinds of uh, um, yeah, interactions. So we looked at uh, law enforcement, healthcare, and we've also looked at uh, vote selling. We've looked at education as well. And what we found um, across these behaviors, we, we found a couple of things uh, um, um, quite interesting and to do with messaging across these behaviors is that actually in terms of talking about social norms of corruption and social norms being understood as the, as the behavioral rules of how people um, engage in society. And there is like the operational definition of a social norm that first of all, you hold onto an empirical expectation. That's your expectation of how people behave and your normative expectation, um, the expectation, the beliefs you have about how other people think you should behave. And then you have a conditional preference to behave in that kind of way um, when you encounter that situation. The example that um, I think maybe the Nigerian audience or in similar audiences um, might um, connect to really well that we use in talking about social norms is the example of um, giving something with your left hand versus your right hand. I'm from Nigeria, I always, uh, uh, and I'm left-handed. And I always adjust my, uh, my, my practice of giving people things based on where I am. From the airport when you arrive, you know, I'm immediately told that your left-handed behavior is not acceptable here. And regardless of whichever way I appear or I seem, there is a social norm that when you're giving someone something, particularly someone older than you, you have to give with your right hand. And now that I haven't been in Nigeria for such a long time, that is going to be like a real sharp adjustment that I will have to make. So uh, in terms of talking about social norms around corruption, even though um, 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 corruption might be pervasive in environments such as Nigeria, what we actually found across the behaviors and the context that we have explored um, is that social norms themselves are not actually as widespread as the actual phenomena is. And we think that's a very, very important uh, um, um, finding to, to uncover and a very, very important finding to bear in mind when we're talking about corruption, particularly in these adverse uh, contexts that you, you, you spoke about where there is a lot of functional corruption, where where the options, for example, uh, like the one you gave about if you're trying to get a hospital bed um, for your sick child, to give 50 naira or 100 naira, it's not even, you know, there is, there is no um, debate about the fact that a parent would do, would engage in this kind of corruption um, um, to ensure that their child um, has, a, has a bed in the hospital. But what we actually found, um, and bringing it to the point of messaging um, is that a lot of the corruption, the corrupt practices, or at least the collective practices that we examined that are termed to be corrupt, what we actually found as driving those practices are descriptive norms. 
So people are really just engaging in this behavior. Of course, the context is very, very important, but people are engaging in these behaviors because they see others engage in this behavior. So it's really empirical expectation driven. And I think there's a lot of research from uh, Christiana Bicchieri, and I think there's a new paper out by, I'll get their names wrong, um, Cole and uh, Kersia, or Kisha, uh, and, and it's around um, social norms of cooperation. And I think the general gist of um, that kind of research, and I think, um, and, and Niles Koblis has actually done this on, on bribery, is that when, um, when people's empirical norms and empirical expectations and normative expectations diverge, people tend to go with what other people are doing. So even though you might have a personal belief that this behavior is wrong, this uh, behavior is unacceptable, I'm morally opposed to this behavior, people will engage in the behavior if they believe others would do the same. So you don't wanna be the one that is uh, frozen out uh, or, you, uh, or you miss an opportunity because you didn't give a bribe or you didn't engage in a corrupt practice. And one of the key uh, points that we try to make in our work is that these descriptive norms are very, very important. And, and they often, and in across you know, the different types of bribery and embezzlement we've looked at, they drive behavior. So it's not social norms, it's descriptive norms. And another thing we found out that, it, that ties into messaging, and I'll, I'll just end my points here, is that people are often quite mistaken about what other people believe about uh, corruption um, or, or certain forms of corruption. And we also think that's really, really important in the literature is called uh, pluralistic ignorance and informs a lot of the collective action problems we have around anti-corruption. Because for most people, they find these behaviors unacceptable. They would rather live in a more honest and, uh, uh, and, and low corruption society, but nobody wants to take on the individual cost of, of anti-corruption. Corruption avoidance is simply too costly, too risky, so no one wants to take on that cost on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really, in terms of messaging, one of the things that we kind of put into our um, one of the recommendations or, or intervention and recommendations that we make is that where there are mistaken beliefs, and particularly around behaviors associated with bribery and education and healthcare around bribe solicitation uh, from law enforcement, we actually found in, and it's, we did this study across Nigeria. So not just Lagos, like this particular one, but in Sokoto and the like, uh, we found in specific states, um, people are mistaken about what other people in their community believe about that behavior. So most people thought, I think in Enugu around law enforcement, four out of 10 people thought everybody else in my community is okay with this. So when you have that kind of a situation where you are going through the world or going through your uh, society environment and you think everybody else is okay with this form of corruption, collective action is really, really challenged in that particular context. So on what kind of messaging works, messaging that indicates you know, what descriptive norms are and messaging that highlights um, people's mistaken beliefs about what other people believe, because that's way, how you galvanize collective action. If you realize that most people in your community really, really don't like this practice, and you're able, able to provide the kind of evidence that supports that, uh, that uh, position or that, or, 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 or that shared belief, that is a powerful, powerful uh, component for collective action. So I'll just end on, on that and pass it on. Thanks, Lena. Fascinating. I, I mean, I've always found your work on social norms in Nigeria extremely, extremely fascinating. And, and you make this very important distinction between what is a descriptive norm and what's a social norm. And it's important to identify or make the distinction between the two, because in this in this adverse context of you know, corruption equilibrium, we need to look for those opportunities. And I think often anti-corruption, uh, you know, people who work on anti-corruption tend to be sort of besieged by gloom and doom. But I think across the board, 
across what our panelists are speaking to, what Karen spoke to, what our work also speaks to, is that there are that, that there are opportunities. But I think the trick is that you know policy should allow most people within the sector to operate without corruption. That's the policy benchmark that we want to use. Policy has to be such that it takes into account those those incentives for horizontal enforcement. So the policy needs to be such that it allows, it, whether it's in education or healthcare or in the electricity sector, allows people to operate in such a way that essentially what, what is happening that you can isolate what we call the genuine thieves from the free riders, the ones who have to, who don't want to pay the cost of, of everyday corruption. When that happens, that's when you can start organizing a collective action. And that's what the evidence gathering really has to be about. So what evidence do we have that this is the kind of policy which will allow us to create that condition that self-enforcement will happen and once self-enforcement happens I can monitor my peers and collective action that then comes in so I think we're, we're already beginning to talk in in, in very common common terms and and our uh, next panelist Heather she's she's also talking uh, spoken a lot and worked a lot on exactly these these aspects of anti-corruption because her one of one of the main points that she makes is corruption has a function it, it's functional corruption and therefore if you're just trying to kind of uh, just clean everything out with a broom there are these unintended consequences so we need to understand that that particular context and then design uh, uh, feasible anti-corruption policy so heather on to you now great thank you so much Pallavi, and, and lovely to hear from karen and, and lena so far i'm um, very pleased to be here uh, as much as i would love to talk about functionality and could do um on and on I, I really wanted to focus as you say on unintended consequences and what this research uh lena's research and others is telling us about this um i've been very lucky to have followed this research um from its inception um and it just goes from strength to strength. You know, I'm really, really pleased uh, to see this, this study coming out. Um, it, it, struck, it struck me straight away when, when the original pilot project, which was uh, Karen had done in Jakarta, when the, the findings came in and they were so surprising because they didn't fit that common sense narrative around what we would expect to see with anti-corruption, uh, interventions as well, and the issue of, of um, unintended consequences was one of the, the first things that um, we talked about. Karen and I have a book chapter coming out very soon in a Routledge handbook on transnational organized crime, and it's a chapter on corruption and transnational organized crime, and, and in it we look at um, five lessons coming out of anti-corruption evidence, research and evidence that are relevant to the organized crime space. The first one is, you know, we need to be problem led, not solution driven. The second is we need to get more specific. The third, unsurprisingly, we need to think about functionality. The fifth is we need to stop using political will as an excuse. But the fourth one I think is really relevant here, which is we need to test what works, including our sacred cows and including things that are common sense as well. And I think all of that aligns really nicely with, with ACE's work. Um, with unintended consequences, it, the research that Karen and, and Nick have done here really highlights why we need to be paying much more attention to potential unintended consequences uh, in anti-corruption interventions as well. You see the concept of unintended consequences in all sorts of policy analysis literature, but it rarely features in research or policy on on anti-corruption as well. And, and uh, Osrecki writing back in 2015 pointed out, you know, and I'm quoting here, although corruption and anti-corruption have a long history as research topics in the social science, little is known about the unintended side effects of anti-corruption measures. And it seems to be a really major gap in the literature, given that anti-corruption is at its heart about forcing those with the power to abuse their positions for their own private gain, to give up this power and to be accountable for their actions. To imagine that that won't have potential unintended consequences just seems a bit un unimaginable. Um, for Merton, unintended consequences are about errors that come about when policy actors haven't considered all of the likely impacts of their policies or their interventions, either because they lack the necessary information or because they refuse to consider information as well. And that's the problem with sacred cows. It's actually quite hard to tell which one it is on the ground. Um, another thing that makes it really challenging with corruption in particular is that any discussion of corruption or anti-corruption often comes with it moral outrage as well. 
and that moral outrage, the need to do to be seen to do something and to not question whether or not you should actually be doing something um, carries its own unintended consequences too. And it's really why um, investing in research like this is so important and why testing matters because it's the way to move past our current belief about sacred cows in order to learn more about what works and importantly, what doesn't work even if it's emotionally or politically difficult to do so. One of the potential unintended consequences that, that the research could look at um, going forward, if the team would like as well, um, that, that really strikes me as, as important, is when you think about anti-corruption messaging on the ground, well, extremists and authoritarians platform on anti-corruption messaging. So they're anti-state, anti, -state, anti um, whoever's in authority as well. And they use that messaging very effectively to attract followers who may themselves have picked up on uh, messages, whether it's formal anti-corruption messaging, like, like Karen and Nick have tested, whether it's journalism, you know, gossip, anything like that as well. Um, you know, this is a hypothesis. I'm not saying that this is you know, a, f a finding you can claim from the research or anything like that. But what if all of those anti-corruption billboards, all of those lessons in school, all of those things over the past 20, 30 years have been feeding into those narratives? And I think Karen and Nick's follow-up paper on what this might mean for democracy makes some unbelievably important points. And I, I assume and hope Nick's going to, to talk about those as well. You know, is there a possibility that we've been undermining democracy and feeding uh, extremist narratives um, by trying to do the common sense thing? And we just don't know, which is why you test and why we should be testing more, more rigorously. The second point and final point I wanted to make about this thinking about messaging as well and looking at it in the, the other direction is the importance for researchers of getting policy messaging right as well, especially when you have tricky research findings. Uh, like this one as well. Researchers are not always well equipped or open to considering how those messages might land on the other side of the table, so to speak. Um, and especially if those might be quite politically challenging. Keeping in, in the sort of vein of the, the counter extremism, I, I've put on Twitter today, and I think uh, Duncan put up our Twitter accounts, but a fantastic article by Lydia Wilson about counter violence and extremist policy. And I'm just gonna quote a little story she says very quickly where she was presenting to the UK government on what works in uh, counter extremist work, which is basically in, in, you know, in her findings here, pretty much nothing. And she says here, and I'm quoting, I suggested that we quit the disastrous CVE approach to focus on making our societies more inclusive and hopeful, thereby addressing many social problems at once and simultaneously avoiding the stigma of, acu of accusing communities of potential terrorism. This didn't go down well as policy advice. Do you disagree with any, anything I've yet said? I asked my interlocutor and he repeats, I cannot go back and tell my government this. I widen the question to the room, does anyone disagree? with what I've said. And an advisor to the then prime minister said he would never publicly say what she'd said. Um, she forestalled my outrage. I know she said, but to save time in this meeting, you need to know that I won't be passing that on. So let's not get into it, right? That's one of the things I think when you're presenting research like this to a policy audience in particular, um, that it's important to understand what that actually means and how to unpack that. I think Nick and Karen are incredibly experienced researchers when it comes to engaging with policy. Um, and they do this better than pretty much everybody I've seen as is the wider SOS ACE team. I do think there's always more that researchers can do to think about no but dot, dot, dot recommendations um, to help our friends and colleagues who have to make the case for why our research that's telling them to do things differently to politicians and decision makers who, who uh, have the authority to do that. And I really think this is a great project to watch for that as well, because what, what I've seen and what they've written, as well as what I've heard them say, is they do that process and they start to go through. So they help make that transition between what you're doing is absolutely wrong, potentially quite dangerous, and we need to stop doing it to, okay, here's what you do to get 
changes done. Um, and I think as they go forward um, in the next phase, which I'm really pleased that through SOCASE, it's going to enable them to take this research and, and adapt it to counter SOC messaging too. It gives them a whole new audience and a whole new challenge as well um, there. And it's going to be great to see what with that research aligns with the SOAS ACE research on anti-corruption, what's similar and what's different as well, and how to, to continue to boost that consistent messaging about unintended consequences and doing things differently. And I think I'll end it there. Thanks. Heather, as always, fascinating intervention there, especially the point you make about you know, uh, the unintended consequence of moral outrage and whether we are getting that right. Um, I'm frankly sitting here in India and, and to go a little off piece, I, I certainly, I certainly seem to think that there's no great research that has gone into it, but this whole anti-corruption moral outrage very well can, can provide the fig leaf that an authoritarian, fundamentalist, extremist government uh, can actually cloak themselves with. So, and we, it's not just India, we've seen that across. It all begins with anti-corruption. You, you, you feed into a certain sense of moral outrage and, and, and exclusion, and then you, know, you just fall off a cliff. But anyway, we, we shan't discuss that here. But I think that that would strike a chord across all our, all our participants. And uh, uh, you know, the other point that, that you made about uh, researchers and how, how to land their research, it's, it's the messaging by the messengers, if you want, in a sense that how, how is it that we as researchers package? I think that's not something we talk about. And I'm really, really glad you, you brought it out. And, and I think that's something that across the three, three sort of uh, branches of ACE we've been working on, how to make it tractable so that we don't say it in a way that the policy implementer says, this is not something I can take to my minister. I think that's a very critical, very critical issue to learn. And I think um, uh, the other point is that uh, coming back to some of, some of the points that we make in SOAS ACE and where I think the similarity lies in these contexts where uh, uh, the common sense approach can, can lead to the solidifying of a particular authoritarian power base, I think our approach is that when power is power is important because you need to create very countervailing sources of power, and that is really most likely to happen by splitting the powerful into those who will then contest that authoritarian regime in their own interest. And I think that is the other puzzle that we in SOAS are also trying to work on. So thanks, Heather, for that, that, that really interesting intervention. And Nick, I think it's over to you to, to round off uh, uh, this particular uh, session. Over to you, Nick. Hey everyone, yeah, so if we haven't depressed you thoroughly enough, I'm going to start by throwing in a couple of additional problems and then hopefully cheer you all up a little bit by rounding up some of the things that have been said so far in terms of potential solutions. Uh, the first thing to say is I completely endorse everything that the previous speakers have said, lots of great insights um, from people who are working at the cutting edge of the field, so um, I don't think I need to add too much to that. The one thing I was going to add to start with that I think is another problem, and Pallavi, you kind of touched on it there with the comments about India, is that another of the things that I think we haven't thought about enough as an international community, I'm talking about now as anti-corruption um, activists, is the ways in which anti-corruption campaigns can be uh, you know, localized and instrumentalized by political leaders for their own purposes. You can see this, a classic example would perhaps be Tanzania under Magafuli, where on the one hand, anti-corruption, yes, was a great and much needed initiative to sweep a clean broom and remove corruption from Tanzania. And Tanzania was a corrupt country where far too much money was being lost. But if you look at the work of my brilliant former PhD student, Dan Padgett, you see that a lot of that process was also manipulated in a way that enabled Magafuli to both increase his control over the ruling party CCM and also increase the costs of being outside of his personal networks and therefore to essentially make it easier for him to establish control. And of course, we know that that control was then used to create a political system which was much more oppressive and controlling. Uh, we could look at India elements of the same we could look right now um, at you know some of the anti-corruption campaigns we see in sub-saharan africa where there's the same risk and I, I mentioned this not just because it demonstrates how international efforts to combat corruption can be subverted or just because you know it reminds us that often we can end up celebrating and applauding something that we don't actually fully understand turns out to have unintended consequences but also for its impact on domestic populations 
I think, you know, one of the things that I've been saying, for example, about Zambia, where we've just seen a transfer of power, is it is great that the new government wants to do, you know, a big anti-corruption drive. It's really important to demonstrate to Zambians that they've, you know, genuinely elected a new government that will not be as corrupt as the, the government of the past led by Egalungu. But it's also important that that does not start to look like a witch hunt that that doesn't start to look like rounding up lots of opposition, now opposition, former ruling party individuals and prosecuting them. Because if you do that in countries like Zambia, you start to get the sense that actually one party, which might draw support from certain parts of the country, is now prosecuting systematically another party, which draws support from other parts of the country. And you can ethnicize and politicize the anti-corruption campaign in ways that actually lose it legitimacy. Um, and so one of the risks right now for President Hichilima in Zambia is that depending on how he prosecutes the anti-corruption campaign, it could actually lose its legitimacy in certain parts of the country. They need, you know, we need to make sure that the anti-corruption campaigns we see target leaders of different parties and different ethnicities and different regions equally to demonstrate that there's a principle being applied there. All too often over the last 20 years, anti-corruption efforts in sub-Saharan Africa in particular have not followed that rule and therefore lost sort of broader public support and legitimacy. And of course, if we then add that to everything we've just been saying about the unintended consequences of anti-corruption messaging, i.e. that sometimes simply by telling people about corruption, you can actually exacerbate the extent to which they think it's a problem and make them defeatist and therefore make them go with the grain and not fight corruption, you can see how actually you know, big the problem is. And Karen and I are actually working on, on a second paper now, which takes it even further. And what we can show in the second paper Paper, which she touched a little bit on, but she didn't say so much about, is that the same anti-corruption messages that in our first paper are shown to make people more willing to actually pay a bribe in the game we play with them, also make people less likely to be willing to pay tax. So there's actual consequence there on the social contract. There's a consequence there for government revenue, potentially, of anti-corruption messaging. And of course, it makes perfect sense. If you're telling people constantly about the dangers of corruption, they think, well, the dangers of corruption mean that tax revenues are being misused. If tax revenues are being misused, why should I pay my taxes? So there could potentially be a relationship here between international anti-corruption efforts and the difficulty of raising tax, which again you know, brings to mind the, the kind of unintended consequences and the inconsistent interrelationship between different international priorities and interventions. Because of course, tackling corruption and raising taxation have been two of the big priorities of the international financial institutions over the last 20, 30 years. So that just brings, I think, you know, to a head quite how difficult and challenging this environment is. To end then, I just wanted to throw out, you know, some of the things that we know about, you know, what works and what makes things better. And here, Lena's done a great job and I'll echo some of the things she said and maybe add a few more, uh, a little bit more kind of flesh to the bone, uh, the, the skeleton that she kind of identified of how this works and what we know. And I'll draw on some of the work that's coming out of social psychology and other people like Alice Evans, who've been, who've been looking at this over the last sort of five, 10 years. And as Lena said, what we know is that people don't change their minds when you simply give them information. They tend to change their minds when they think people like them are already changing their minds. In other words, the way to get people to shift is to persuade them that people in their peer group have already shifted. You can shift attitudes on gender, homosexuality, corruption, if you persuade people that people like them are already opting into the belief systems you want. You can't do it simply by telling them that their views are wrong and immoral and they should actually opt into these other views because they're the right ones. So we know from that research, it's much more effective if you can get that sense that people are already moving into the behaviors that you want to encourage. The challenge with anti-corruption is how do we do that in a context where there is not a lot of evidence? We could design adverts that tell people, people like you, you know, educated people, business people, people you aspire to, are not corrupt. They're leading the anti-corruption fight. And we could design lovely posters with lovely images. But unless they ring true for ordinary citizens, they're not going to be effective. And would those things ring true? Probably not. And the reason for that, I think, is something that none of us have actually perhaps pinpointed as explicitly as we should, which is that all of this is underpinned by fairly high levels of public distrust in government and public belief that there are high levels of corruption. So, for example, in the paper uh, that Karen and I look at, we look at, you know, assumptions about corruption, assumptions about the state. And as Lena has already said, 
they're often much worse than the reality. There's often people who believe corruption and bribery is even more prevalent than it really is. And in most of the countries we've been talking about, but also if you look at the research in the United States, in Denmark, in Australia, there's a public perception of the public sector, which is often even more problematic than the reality. So a recent paper on Denmark showed that simply by labeling an institution, a public institution rather than a private one, people's assumptions about its efficiency went down when all the information provided to them was the same. All you changed was private to public. So we can see that a lot of what we're talking about here is actually the reason this priming effect is so strong, the reason this triggering mechanism is so strong, is partly because there's a prior set of understandings and assumptions about the nature of the state and about corruption that this is then playing into. And in our paper, Karen and I actually show that people who have a pre-existing kind of pessimism, we call them pessimistic perceivers, people who already believe that corruption is really pervasive and endemic, are much more likely to be negatively affected by the anti-corruption messaging than people who do not have that existing uh, position. So one of the key questions that we actually have to ask if we really want to do the revolutionary job of creating a situation where anti-corruption messaging works is how do we actually get to that underlying perception? How do we deal with those pessimistic perceivers and turn them into something, um, you know, into people who don't have those negative perceptions of government and of corruption? And of course, the answer to some extent has to be actions. We can't do all of that through messaging and through persuasion. There has to be a change in reality that we can do that with. And in a sense, I'm therefore bringing us back completely full circle to what Karen said at the very beginning, which is we need to look at the interaction between messages and actual government policy and changes, because it needs to be the connection between the two. We do see in some messaging more of a positive opportunity. Some of the messages we've tried around taxation in particular, some of the messages that have been tried around the effect of corruption on local communities appear to have less negative impacts and in some cases more positive impacts. We also know, as I've said, from the social norms literature that positive reinforcement of social norms can work. But both of those things are only going to be really effective if we also see governments taking action and operating in ways that reinforce those messages so that they appear to be true. So what we actually need is a combination of two things happening at the same time. We need to be much more careful in our messaging. We need to target our messaging and not just aim it at everybody. We need to be very careful to try and avoid sending the worst messages to the most vulnerable groups in terms of the unintended consequences. But we also need to make sure that when we design those messages, they're related to actual government programs that provide people with reasons to believe the messages and therefore give them resonance within the populations that we're targeting them at. If we can do those two things, we can perhaps start to break through this deep-seated set of perceptions, which I think is underpinning a lot of the problems that we're talking about. That is a massively difficult challenge. It's a difficult challenge because it requires both good messaging and actual government policy change. Um, but I think we have to you know, face up to the depth of the problem before we can start to resolve it. And I think to me, that is the problem. The problem is that at times we're also trying anti-corruption -mess anti messaging in countries where the messages aren't actually fully true because we're encouraging people to adopt forms of behavior that aren't actually rational for them, given the governments they have and the context in which they're working. And so unless we deal with those two things at the same time, the actual context on the ground, as well as the messaging, we won't be able to design uh, anti-corruption messages that avoid doing more harm than good. So hopefully those few comments have just both added a little bit of nuance on maybe how much the how great the challenge is, but also a few more concrete points on ways that we might be able to move forwards and look forward to the questions and answers coming up. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Nick. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think you you uh, ended up being as pessimistic as you thought uh, uh, you would be or indeed want to be. And uh, uh, I think we, we're taking away a lot of very, very good points here. I just wanted to make uh, a few points, again, going back to uh, the sort of framing questions that we started with and the work that we do on ACE. Absolutely dovetails with what you said, Nick, about, you know, you start identifying people who are already moving into behaviors that we want them to move into and that's that's what the evidence base has to unearth and that's that's where anti-corruption really has to has to uh, pitch for and that's completely relevant to the work that we do because when we do deep dive 
into sectors. We, we, we're working in electricity, we're working in healthcare, health sector absenteeism, we're working in, this, uh, in the skills uh, training sector. What we do when we do our deep dive looking for, for evidence is, is real uh, instances of behavior that's different from uh, the conventional sectoral corrupt behavior. Not everybody's out to make uh, huge amounts of rents from investments in the electricity sector. Not every skills provider uh, you know, provides uh, falsified data so that they can make their uh, claims uh, fr from the government. Not every doctor for public in the public healthcare sector actually starts out wanting to be absent. We in fact find a large majority, and we've done this in the healthcare sector with, with discrete choice experiments. They've been extremely successful, thrown up some very fascinating data that in each of these cases, we actually find a large body of, of actors who are uh, behaving in the way that we want them to. There are uh, you know, power plants or, or power companies in Bangladesh which, which uh, can set up power plants at very, very low costs and are actually supplying power at very, very inflated costs. It's the same company doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, displaying two kinds of behavior. We see doctors who come into work at a time when a lot of other doctors are absent. We see skills providers actually providing skills training and actually upskilling uh, the, you know, the, the sort of trainees with them and justifying uh, what they are invoicing the government. So when we look at these kinds of behavior, we then try and investigate, well, what is it that's making them behave this way? What is the incentive structure that they're facing? Collect this evidence base. And this is really that optimistic evidence base that we look for in so I say. So I think the, the way that you are approaching messaging and then the way that we are approaching uh, messaging at so I say is, is, is in that sense, extremely, extremely similar. So. My next question to, to all of you, you, you've talked about you know, how we need to message, we, we've talked about uh, instrumentalizing it, the unintended consequences. I think we can, we can start looking somewhat at how we gather this evidence. How do we, how do we know that this is, this is where behavior has actually moved towards? Lena talked about it. Uh, this is the behavior that we need to capture. Nick, you talked about it. Uh, uh, you know. So I think my next sort of, uh, a round of discussion here and please also now that we've we've laid the foundation what would be really interesting is if you you know started questioning each other i i can i can jump in and, and ask a few questions if you uh, nick you you just raised a little a few points about about lena's work uh, feel free to go ahead and do that and we can we can have a sort of moderated round but really how do we build up this evidence base how do we do that nudging that you're talking about and what really would be feasible and effective in these in these adverse contexts so um, you know you know over to you and uh, maybe we can start in in reverse order so it can be nick it can be heather it can be lena and it can be karen just just to make sure that we are fair all around nick would you like to start um yes um i mean i i sort of said everything i was i was thinking of saying on that particular issue um, I think, you know, one of the things that I think we, we might want to sort of talk about as a group um, is also whether or not we can start to think about different kinds of contexts. Uh, you know, Karen has done great work in a number of different areas, not just Nigeria, as she talked about. Um, and we've seen similar effects around the world. So one of the things that we're initially thinking is that at least some of the unintended consequences we're seeing might be fairly universal in, shall we say, what are traditionally called developing countries in urban areas that are you know, diverse and have high levels of corruption. It seems like what we're finding is fairly common in those places. Um, and in a number of different areas like that, in different continents, people have found roughly the same things that anti-corruption messaging doesn't help or is counterproductive. But I think we could perhaps go further than that. Are there particular contexts in which different types of messages are more likely to be successful and unsuccessful? So for example, are we also looking to some extent at the hardest cases, you know, by looking at, for example, Papua New Guinea, Lagos, etc. Are they some of the toughest cases because of public understandings and expectations of corruption? Is it possible that the messages that we've been testing would have a slightly different effect if we applied them in a country with lower levels of corruption, uh, for example? So one sort of first cut might be to try and think about not necessarily kind of another redundant typology, but starting to think through whether or not we need to say more about the kind of context in which different campaigns are more likely to be 
problematic and not problematic. One of the things we haven't really seen so much so far is comparative research. So Karen has done some great work in a number of different countries, but most people who do this, because you need quite a lot of resources and you do it um, as an experimental design by showing people treatments, you tend to do it in one country or two countries max. We haven't seen big research programs that have tried to do this in 10, 15 countries, varying the levels of development, varying levels of education, varying levels of corruption. So going back to Heather's point about needing to test things, I think one constructive way might be to start by doing that. We, as Heather was saying, as part of the extension of this research um, an extension of ACE, we'll be looking to do that in Albania and hopefully, you know, trying to find out uh, some interesting things there, well, obviously significant differences as well as similarities to the cases we've looked at in the past. And I think that's one aspect of this that might be really interesting, trying to do more comparative research. As we've heard, you know, most of the people on the panel, most of the others in this area are focused on case studies. So leveraging those comparisons and trying to get some insights into what might work in different contexts, I think would be something uh, we might take forwards. But I'll look forward to the answers of the rest of the panels to these quite difficult and interactive just, just a point of curiosity here. I'll throw in as moderator, and you know, all of you feel feel free to to, to jump in here. But uh, you, you know, your research uh, identifies a non-pessimist based on based on uh, uh, you know very ro uh, robust survey data. What I'm curious about is uh, how do we know what types of messages non-pessimists would would respond to positively? That's what I meant by how do we generate the evidence base? I'm I'm looking at it in terms of you know really methods because that's that's also what is. I think the method that you use, you and Karen use in the paper is extremely interesting and, and could be a guide for us in, in doing this kind of anti-corruption research and designing the messages. So in this case, it happened to be that tax was what, what the non-pessimist responded to positively. How, how do we design it? That's, that's what I meant by uh, generating that, that evidence base. To me, it would seem that uh, what, they, what a particular, uh, you know, sort of uh, section of non-pessimists would respond to is based on, let's say, their, their material interests and their perceived feasibility of their actions having an effect on their, you know, own welfare. How, how do we sort of build this in? These are difficult questions, but it's something that you, Nick and Carrie, have set yourself up for, because these are the kinds of things that, that you know, one, one is curious about. So I was wondering if the two of you had uh, any response to that. that that's really it. Well, I'll let Karen uh, answer some of that. I think one thing that we do need to do in the future is, is move beyond the kind of lab. So, you know, one thing Karen and I have talked about is would it be good to shift from doing this under a more controlled setting uh, or and we did the last project in Lagos on household interviews. But would it be interesting, you know, to move from that into actually looking at, you know, real world posters in a real world setting. So not showing someone something on a tablet in a formal interview, but having posters, you know, in one part of a town, having not posters in another part of the town and working out how that operates. I also think, Palavi, I agree with your points about, you know, the sorts of things you might think about that might drive and trigger uh, more positive responses. I think the other thing to add to that is, of course, you know, local context and local resonance. Um, and one of the things that, you know, most of us have tended to do, um, or at least in our, say, Lagos paper, is to, to use uh, English uh, predominantly. And, you know, we, we often the sorts of messages we see pushed by the international community tend to be more generic. And there's perhaps more to be done in terms of tapping into local norms and cultures that can then leverage some of this. So if you look, for example, at John Lonsdale's you know, work on moral ethnicity in Kenya, he talks about a very rich set of moral debates within the Kikuyu community of Kenya in particular, uh, in which there are certain ideas about how wealth and leadership should operate. Now, those don't necessarily contain kind of democratic ideals of accountability, nor do they include socialist ideals of redistribution, but they do contain norms and values that can be used to hold leaders to account when they breach those you know, the, those uh, legitimate um, distribution and, and wealth. And so you could then use that as a way of trying to develop a set of messaging that would capture to a much greater extent how the community has historically thought about and talked about the distribution of resources to try and make sure that things are seen to be as it were, more illegitimate when you talk about them, and also then to perhaps remind people that there was a point in time when things weren't as they were today, where these 
ideas uh, evolved out of. So that might be one way of trying to tap into that collective memory on a more collective basis than the individual basis. The other opportunity, of course, which you, you know your comment about individual incentives kind of draws us to is to use social media messaging and targeting to get messages to people. So we kind of reverse the evils of Cambridge Analytica to use that kind of big data analysis to target people with individual messages that would not be general, would not be blankets, and would be specifically targeted at the right community in order to achieve the maximum positive effect without doing the harm. That's, I think, something we do need to really look at for the future. The challenge at the minute, of course, is that that big data is most available right now on developed economies where people are on Amazon and buy their you know, shopping on Tesco's, and therefore you can build that complex data profile of every individual. It's less easy to do that in a lot of the countries that we've been talking about where that data doesn't exist in that kind of way. And so that kind of targeted messaging can't be quite as specific just yet but I think that is the next frontier and that's something that you know if ACE keeps going and people hopefully give us some more funding maybe that can be the project in four or five years time but over to Karen for now. Um, yeah just to add to what Nick was saying I, I think I mean Nick and I have sort of lived in this world of how do we make um, what would the what would the dream study be with all the resources in the world and, and how could we address the limitations and I think What's important to acknowledge at this point in the conversation is that the evidence base we have is they're based off of limited, you know, studies that have serious limitations. Um, and um, some of those are, as Nick said already, that they've only been tested in certain contexts and really in only, if, I, if I'm thinking right, really only in urban areas, certainly my studies have been. Um, but Aside from that, there's several, and I think what that does is it lets us think about what could the next, um, the next sort of um, studies or the dream study um, do. So I think what Nick was saying about the comparative um, study that would be ideal to really look at is this universal, a uh, universal impact, or is it context specific? Um, I think also maybe what's missing so far from the discussion is, is to look at who is the messenger. And I think that this relates to SOAS, ACE's um, um, sort of uh, uh, perspective. So, you know, if the government's lost its popular credibility on, on really effectively uh, fighting corruption, so is there another group that has more credibility or legitimacy around this? Um, and so it does speak to that um, so as ACE approach about recognizing and identifying who are the influence, potential influential people and groups that can shift things. Um, and this would be really intimately dependent on context, I would think, um, you know, who has legitimacy, who whose messages might work. Um, how can you test that in the field? I think it would really depend on context. Um, and then legitimacy for for who? So what we know about the research on legitimacy, of course, is that this there isn't you know one group that that holds legitimacy for everybody. And so th then it gets us into all sorts of um, potentially um, really like dividing the population and, and kind of hairy ground about about who do we put our um, resources into thinking about who can carry um, legitimate messages. Something that Heather was talking about earlier that I think also relates to this point is so Heather and I have done research on a, on a range of other things and, and one of the um, messages that we've had in, in a different um, in a corruption functionality framework is to look first at what is the aim of anti corruption. And I think it's important to recognize that messaging usually has more than one aim or if it has one aim it's not explicit. So is it is the messaging um, supposed to get people to report corruption? Is it to get people to think differently about their votes, about how they can mobilize their votes to create more accountability? Is it to get people to avoid engaging in corruption? Is it, you know, what is, what is the aim? And it might be the case that some messages from certain messengers might be better at achieving certain aims um, than others. So that's another thing to think about. And then I guess before I hand it over, um, the bigger kind of, uh, I don't want to cause too much more pessimism, but the bigger question I think 
is we've only talked about messaging, um, but what about anti-corruption in general? So the policy energy around anti-corruption to the extent that the public is made aware of it may very well have the same impacts on what the public thinks about corruption and anti-corruption. And so while it's nice and neat for us to talk about um, awareness raising specifically, specifically and its efficacy, what I wonder is whether or not what we find and what we think about the impacts of awareness raising, if there's a more generalized impact that we might be finding with other anti-corruption policy energy um, that, that's being heavily invested in all over the place. I'll hand it back impact. Yeah, yeah. We always come back to impact. And um, maybe, uh, Heather, uh, you might want to come in. Uh, and, and respond or, or speak to both what Nick and Karen have said? Well, actually, actually, I wanted to go to one of the, the questions slash comments in the in the chat um, because it, it was fascinating. And I I started thinking about something with SOSACE in general, and actually it's connected to something coming out soon in SOCASE, which I can't believe I, I've never thought of. And so I'm really grateful for that. And we'll see, Karen and Nick might go, actually, that's rubbish. but. Um, so Benam uh, Zoghi, and I, I apologize if I've, if I've not pronounced that right, put a, a question up about messaging strategy in Iran and how in Iran, the public have very high expectations from anti-corruption efforts. So, you know, the opposite of what Nick and, and Karen described in that kind of sense um, and how it's really challenging because that goes with uh, a, a lack of tolerance for cooperation and coalition making because of a, a polarized uh, politic. Um, and so what I, I was going to say to, to Ben, or what I, what I will reply to that is to say that actually one of the, the challenges I think that SOAS ACE's research overall really points to is the importance of feasibility. So high expectations for anti-corruption efforts that aren't realistic may actually be extremely harmful. And so whether there's an anti-corruption messaging element in there, if people have expectations that can't possibly be met, whether it's because the political environment is too polarized, whether it's because the resource levels are too low or um, because you know, forms of corruption fill functions like Karen and I have written about, you know, people don't have, you know, they've not been paid, they, they you know, can't get by without it, whatever it might be then that's going to end up feeding that sense of, of despair and so on. And I, and I think this is you know, such an important contribution from So Essays and others about the need to really think about um, feasible reforms, which almost inevitably, you know, as Lena and others, you know, the, those of us working on collective action and corruption have talked about, you know, it's almost always going to involve some kind of uh, cooperation and you know, formal or informal coalitions uh, and so on. Um, but I was thinking about one of the, you know, two of the first outputs that will come out um, hopefully mid-October from SAWCASE. So the first one is gonna be an evidence note on what the evidence tells us about uh, serious organized crime and political will. So like so essays, we share a similar approach looking at politically feasible um, interventions. And um, there's also going to be a short conceptual piece that goes with it. And one of the, the things that we're, we're writing about is a kind of older definition of political will as the sum of political want, political can, and political must, right? So we, we often focus on the political want, but we don't think enough about the, the can and the must. And, you know, can, you know, thinking about Derek Brinkerhoff's kind of groundbreaking paper on political will and anti-corruption about 10 plus years ago, you know, can is about capacity. So if there isn't capacity, whatever the messaging is telling you, it's, it's just not going to succeed. So it, there has to be a degree of feasibility that goes into messaging. And I don't, I've never seen anything like that. I don't know if Nick, Nick or Karen have seen that. The must, sort of Derek talks about how that really links to public pressure and, and citizen engagement as well. And so what anti-corruption messaging could do is to create that momentum, that sense of, of must to go with it. Um, and then the want is really about things like personal sense of civic duty, a, a personal sense of integrity and so on. But the point being made in that is that you, you can't, you don't get political will, whatever that may be without all three of those. So you can want it 
and there could be public pressure, but if you don't have the resources, if it's not feasible and there isn't the capacity there, then it's not going to happen and then that could um, have blowback. So, um, so I'm not sure, uh, Ben, um, if that answers your question or not, but it's definitely made me think that um, we all need to have a conversation afterwards about what to do with that, because I'm now really excited about, about that. So thanks. Thank you, Heather. Maybe, uh, Lena, do you, do you want to come in and respond to, uh, there's a lot of issues that have been thrown up, how to gather evidence, there's big data, there's the can, must, want, uh, how do we use the social norms, you know, what, what the social norms research is telling us to actually generate evidence. You know, my question to you could, could well be, uh, how do we, we know there are descriptive norms and there are social norms, how do we, you know, you know sort of sift the two apart and then design uh, messaging or policy accordingly. Take your pick. You you really have. It's a small I have a lot. I have a lot. And <laughs> while everyone, Nick was talking and Karen and Heather, was like just my my brain was going off on every tangent because there's lots of really really in interesting points that we could be talking about a whole bunch of things for a very very long time. But um, I think we've kind of covered a lot of ground on the on the feasibility side of things. And I think while um, 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 everyone was talking about this feasibility point, I wanted to actually, I didn't say this in the beginning, but I should have also mentioned that uh, we should also bear in mind uh, the sociability uh, um, aspect of corruption. And this is something um, that we looked at in our work on the role of religion in, um, in, the, social, in the social acceptance of corruption. This was work that we put out, I think, in March of, of this year. And um, it would, so I'm going to talk about evidence gathering after this. But in this particular part of our survey, when we're looking at the role of religion in how sociable or, or people's judgments of a particular corrupt act, we actually found that when you, when you turned the purpose of, um, say, someone embezzling government funds or taking government funds for their personal use, when you turned um, that question on its head, that it wasn't just, it wasn't about personal use, it was about um, a person taking government money for supporting their religious community or building a mosque or a church or something like that, or giving to charity um, in through their religious community, people's uh, judgments of that behavior changed even though on the whole, most people thought this particular practice was unacceptable. When we did the randomization, it was really, really cool to be able to finally actually get something statistically significant when you randomize um, this type of behavior. When we randomized um, um, and changed um, the purpose or the reason why somebody would engage in, you know, what would be a typical kind of public sector corruption, regardless of the amounts or whatever, if it was for your uh, community, people generally had a lower threshold of a negative judgment of that kind of behavior. Of course, you know, for the most part, most people thought it was wrong, but when they thought, okay, if it was actually for your religious community, we can actually justify that. So one of the, one of the reasons why we did um, that kind of investigation was and this to the point of funding and evidence gathering that we're all talking about and all the anti-corruption uh, programming that's going on everywhere is that a lot of funding is going to faith-based uh, um, organizations or at least faith-based anti-corruption messaging and um, a lot of the and I think uh, Heather's done this this work uh, for long for for years and years and years, and we actually even reference her work in 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 our paper in our in our project in this aspect of our project. Is that a lot of assumptions um, contribute to moralizing the corruption problem, and we already know that that is hugely a problem, particularly in these contexts that we speak about when we, when uh, um, and people actually have specific. Uh, um, um, negative personal beliefs about corruption, you don't need to moralize a problem that is functionally um, okay for most people. So um, we found it really, really important to understand the institutional context. And I think Nick mentioned that, that institu institutional context matters. And there was a study, I wish, I don't know if there's an update of it, but there was a study 
in 2012, um, I think it's Summer now, I can't remember um, his first name, um, but there was Summer and a whole bunch of other people who did this study when they were looking at the relationship between religion and corruption to the point about institutional context matter, mattering. And they found that the only context where religion had a positive role of reducing corruption or a role in anti-corruption was where political institutions uh, were democratic and societies had strong democratic values. So I think this also ties into the point um, um, and, and the concerns that everybody um, has raised about uh, political will and political action and that you know political actions can be targeted against political opponents and the like. Um, so what we um, recommend in that context, because we also notice a lot of work um, being done around behavioral, behavioral change, um, supporting the work of a lot of faith-based organizations and this particularly in Nigeria. What we recommended in that context was that um, you can have faith-based organizations what, because of their social influence, their uh, collective action, uh, convening power, faith-based organizations working in the space of, uh, uh, of um, amplifying citizens' voices for community monitoring. And this is also, um, you know, it ties into um, Karen's point about localized messaging. So you can have um, faith-based actors working in that dimension of anti-corruption, not directly on anti-corruption in the sense of moralizing the problem, because it seems to be the, the angle that as a faith-based organization, it makes sense. That's kind of the message um, and their messaging um, to take um, the, the approach of moralizing the problem and appealing to people's individual ethical standards and their belief systems and so on. But again, um, um, what is the case in a lot of these adverse uh, uh, contexts is that when you load these individual costs, people are unable to meet these individual standards because the, because the individual cost is too great. But faith-based organizations can intervene in this context where they distribute the cost of anti-corruption, of resisting either uh, a, 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 a shakedown, et cetera, et cetera. Faith-based um, leaders, faith-based institutions, faith-based actors can play a powerful role in that. And another aspect that I wanted to speak about um, is uh, around, um, and I think this is this is really, if we we're all kind of fantasizing, if we had a whole bunch of money to do more research, um, my kind of fantasy around uh, our social norms work is if we had uh, money to integrate some social norms and social network analysis, because we were talking about you know, who the messenger is and the legitimacy of the messenger. What I really would love um, for a lot of work on behavioral interventions to move into is this kind of, is identifying uh, norm violators, identifying, you know, the kinds of characteristics of uh, a first mover uh, and somebody who would abandon a behavior and take on a new behavior. There, of course, in social psychology, there is, uh, there are metrics and the different measures for, measurement tools for identifying these kinds of uh, specific people within a network, um, identifying their norm sensitivity, their risk perception, their risk sensitivity. And um, when we did our work on law enforcement, that was kind of one of the things that I hoped that we could move forward on doing, identifying individuals within a context where social norms are actually present and drive um, a behavior. In, uh, identifying individuals who are norm violators and you need another layer to be able to do that people that you can target messaging to um, uh, in contexts where you don't have these kinds of individuals um, there's a lot of work around edutainment that you can create fictional characters but this has mostly been te tested around risky uh, um, sex behavior health and the like but we haven't had a lot of that in anti-corruption. That's another thing that would be great to see if you can, um, if you can uh, model and project um, images of um, norm violators who go against the grain, who behave differently, and if you have, if you can have um, kind of collective behavior change off the back of that. But in terms of evidence gathering, what did, what would really be great um, for us to see a bit more 
around behavior change is identifying you know, norm violators, who the messengers are, the kinds of characteristics um, they have, and targeting messaging um, or different types of messaging for all of these different components of, uh, uh, of a reference network. I'll just end there. I think there are a couple of questions, I think, a ton of them. Yeah, yeah. Lena, thanks a ton. I was going to, uh, you know, invite the panelists to uh, answer Claudia's question, but I can see Heather typing away. So that's that's absolutely great, Heather, for picking it up. <laughs> because I was going sequentially. Claudia was the first one to get a question in. Heather, do you want to keep typing or do you want to say it up? You're on mute, Heather, line of the century. Sorry, sorry. Um, actually, if I say it, because that way it, it actually, um, what I was going to say links to Kathy's um, really interesting question as well. And and uh, so hi to both of you, by the way. Um, but I was going to say to Claudia that I, I'm not actually sure if research is is definitely out there on this. I think it's it's worth looking into. But I, I wonder if there's research around service delivery that's not linked to um, to corruption specifically that could be worth looking into, particularly around any interventions that are aimed at improving citizens' understanding about what they can expect from service service delivery and provision. So, so kind of rights-based approaches to civic education or something like that that are focused very much on what you're what you're entitled to and what the quality should be and so on. Because you know it would be interesting to look to see if there's any evidence already or if maybe there could be future research to see, you know, does that indirectly affect their attitudes towards corruption as a positive unintended consequence of those sorts of activities? And, you know, it, just like we don't, pay, you know, we don't pay enough attention to unintended consequences on anti-corruption, but that could be positive as well as negative. And Karen and I have papers out on that as well. Um, having said that, I'm not convinced then that even if the evidence is there to say that happens, I'm not convinced that we either can or should try to design for those kinds of positive, unintended, indirect consequences. I, I don't think we're that clever. And I think the, the sort of more we, we kind of add layers and layers of complexity onto what we do, um, that we end up not doing anything well. But also if we kind of go to the point about, you know, the research showing that problem-driven approaches rather than solution-led approaches are important, then, then trying to combine two different problems in one thing could actually, um, it's not very problem driven and it could lead to problems. But I, I think that we, we don't do well enough at identifying those indirect effects, um, which is I think a whole, a whole new area of potential research as well. So I'm not sure if that, um, again, I'm not sure it answers and I'd love to know if there was research out there uh, on this, because I think it would be fascinating and important. So thanks. Um, Karen, well, I mean, can I add to Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. so Claudia's question, uh, in case anyone didn't see it, is basically, is there um, evidence on whether or not messaging that doesn't use the term corruption, uh, like what impact has that had on attitudes about corruption? I think it's fantastic. It'd be a great um, focus uh, uh, for uh, one of uh, a treatment, you know, a treatment in the future. But so all of the messages I've personally tested and all that I've seen do explicitly mess, uh, mention corruption. But one thing Nick and I found is that for the non-pessimistic perceivers, so the people who, who aren't already convinced that corruption is extremely widespread, that this message about taxes linking corruption to taxes, so it did explicitly mention taxes, but this message about taxes um, didn't have, um, such a, 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 a negative impact. Instead, it actually discouraged pe those people who weren't um, pessimistic perceivers to um, not bribe in our game. So it was like our one uh, positive or optimistic finding from the study. And I think part of the way that, Nick, remind me if I'm getting it wrong, but part of the way we interpret that is that that message, aside from the rest, actually don't implicate people and it's not mentioning the specific government but instead it's mentioning taxes and corruption and so we thought maybe what might be the case is is you can talk about corruption but if you're not pointing the finger directly at the government um perhaps that's when you're you you aren't necessarily priming this issue of the the government being involved um so i think there might be something to that is is sort of the moral of the story Right. 
Um, I'll just quickly go to the other question that Rosemary Ventura had with, I'm just going by time, so uh, this is not favoritism. Uh, she says, with his excellent example from Zambia, Nick touched on concerns that anti-corruption efforts may be perceived as partisan if prosecutions seem unfairly targeted towards one party or group. Can this exacerbate conflict dividers, existing tensions, grievances in fragile contexts? Example, thanks, exclamation mark. I think, Nick, that one's for you. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that it can. I think we've seen that um, in countries like Kenya, for example, where kind of the within the power sharing government of President uh, Kenyatta and opposition leader, President Kibaki, opposition leader Raila Odinga, you know, the kind of use of corruption allegations was kind of a form of politics um, and played into ethnic tensions uh, that were left over from the political violence after the 2007 elections. So yes, I think that kind of use of corruption as a kind of divisive issue, as a way of, you know, persecuting people or removing people of particular communities, particular parties, can then exacerbate and play into all of the kinds of divisive politics that you know we think of sometimes in those highly ethnicized or you know highly salient communal identity countries in which politics may be conflictual. Um, and of course, the tricky thing is that it's, you know, it's also in some senses just, I mean, it may just be that these people committed terrible crimes. It may be that they were corrupt. And so, you know, yes, they should be prosecuted. And yes, that in that sense, you know, having these people jailed and recouping the money is, you know, just. The problem is, you know, that as we've been talking about, you know, public perceptions are critical if your aim is to shift public attitudes and public behavior. And so even if something is, you know, formally just, you then have to consider the appearance of it. So, yes, I think that's a very uh, real concern. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think the next question, uh, Kathy, I think uh, both Karen and uh, Heather have answered your question. Florencia, you had a a number of very interesting points. And uh, I'm just going to read that through. But I think there was one question in chat, which uh, just got picked in. So um, here we are. Uh, there is Brunilda. And she talks about how do we identify the right champions that could serve as examples for other peers. So to start this horizontal monitoring and collective action, how to do that in countries such as Albania, where finding such people are difficult. And if I may, since uh, Brunilda, you've talked about horizontal monitoring, we are not really talking about picking specific champions, so to say, uh, for, for messaging, since this is a much more sectoral approach, electricity or fertilizer or, or uh, skills training, we're actually looking for sets of actors who behave differently. So they're not champions in that, in that conventional sense of the word that you pick up somebody who becomes an anti-corruption champion, but these are people who signal different behavior. Uh, they are in the same sort of adverse political economy, if you want, but they are actually, their behavior is much more rule following and therefore more efficient, that the sectoral outcome is more efficient. They're producing maybe power at a cheaper rate or training uh, people without uh, uh, capturing the sort of training uh, fee. Uh, and then we, we, we work backwards from that, collect that kind of data, sectoral data, and then see how we can devise policy in the sector, uh, broaden it out so that other players in the sector can also, also follow that policy. But if others wanted to take Brunilda's point about identifying the right champions, it's an important question. Anyone or, okay, I guess not. Silence means um, they're done with this question. Um, Kathy, your points, oh, uh, I've seen them all as answered. Um, Lena, uh, uh, I don't think uh, Kathy's question has been answered. Should I read it out to you? Fascinating Lena in terms of messaging yes, to come back. Okay, here again. Fascinating, Lena. In terms of messaging to combat descriptive norms, do we have examples of how this has inspired collective action? I'm finding it hard to think about messaging that might do this in a way that would be positive, not make individuals feel guilty or complicit, and would spur collective action. Would you have any examples? They would be helpful. Well, yeah, I've been, um, I was thinking about that, and I think we were thinking about that um, when we were doing our work and, and when we you know, continually just um, uncovering that a lot of the corrupt behavior we're looking at was being driven by uh, descriptive norms. 
um, we were thinking, okay, so what do you do with this kind of evidence? What do you do? Um, how do you design measure, uh, messages or just generally interventions that um, um, demonstrate that a lot of the corruption that people are engaging in, um, they disapprove of it, um, they would rather a different kind of uh, equilibrium. Um, so um, the only example, I don't, short answer to that, don't have a specific kind of tidy example of how this has inspired collective action, but um, internally and just um, it, in my mind, I think um, the uh, uh, the collective action movement, and I think I wrote that in my response to to, to Karen, uh, Kathy, um, was um, the collective action movement or against police brutality and police corruption in Nigeria um, last at uh, the end of summer into October as an example of um, people um, realizing that um, a, um, a particular behavior or practice was unacceptable to most people and actually acting upon it. Of course, we know how tragically the NSARS um, the movement to end police brutality that was a hashtag NSARS um, um, what happened uh, in uh, with, with the killings in in Lekki in Lagos, um, but I I find it really a very inspiring example of um, of increasing numbers of people realizing that a behavior is unacceptable to most of us and actually taking civic action um, against it or at least to demonstrate or or um, to demonstrate protest resist. Um, um, highlight the fact that this behavior is unacceptable. Of course, I believe we haven't heard the last of um, the movement against uh, police brutality and police corruption in Nigeria. I think there's, there, there, is, there will be um, political ramifications for, for, for that um, moving forward. But I think in terms of just the example, an example of people acting on their true beliefs and um, and you know shifting away from um, or realizing almost at the same time, of course, not coordinated by an NGO, and that's another point. You know, it wasn't necessarily just neatly coordinated by a group of NGOs who thought, okay, today we're going to start off, you know, this movement, and X Y numbers of people are going to get on board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think the fact that it was so um, organic. The fact that it was almost as though there wasn't any hierarchy of leadership um, added legitimacy and authenticity to the movement and you had more ordinary people, you know, being able to feeling confident, feeling that they weren't taking on the individual cost of resisting um, this or at least indicating that this behavior was unacceptable, knowing that there were more people within their community that found this these types of practices or the behavior of the police unacceptable and feeling that they would have allyship with others in their community. So for me, that's kind of like the biggest really dynamic example. Um, there's a lot of lessons to be, I, I hope I, you know, able to examine you know, and really, really write about that particular example. Uh, and, you know, as an example of people acting on their true beliefs in the context of uh, uh, um, descriptive norms versus injunctive norms. Um, so, but that is definitely an example I think we should look at, you know, what worked, what made it happen, what, are, what were the triggers, how was it sustained, and how can you have that kind of collective action um, happen in a way that there were, fewer risk and you don't have these kinds of unfortunate unintended uh, consequences uh, um, of um, people dying um, in, in, uh, in civic for, for demonstrating um, their political uh, position against uh, police brutality. I think Kathy also brought up the point about the NSARS movement and how norms uh, shifted. So that's that's interesting. But again, you know, we were all, uh, as you know, Nigeria observers watching the NSARS movement. Some of it unfolded on Twitter back in the day when Twitter was was very much allowed. But it was interesting that there was a sort of different take coming from, uh, you know, many sort of youth movements in northern Nigeria, where the whole idea was well, you can't do away with the police because we need the police. Look at the kind of insecurity we are facing. We we can't have uh, a disband the police movement like we did for Black Lives Matter. So again, uh, where and how messages are, are devised and, you know, again, where it's landing, in this case, 
becomes very interesting. There is, there is no one size fits all, even though NSARS was extremely emotive and, and did take a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of inspiration from the Black Lives Matter movement. So, okay. But, but to, to move away, I don't know, Lena, should I move on? Because I'm mindful of time. No, I just want to say that different circumstances that um, made the protests play out differently in northern Nigeria. So Absolutely. just social media platforms, um, there are definitely contextual factors as the kinds of norms and just power distance and all of those types of, yeah. you know, how power is distributed yeah. in northern Nigeria yeah. and just how these conversations happen quite differently from the south exactly. country and urban centers. So all of those should be taken into consideration. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, Florence, you really great points there, but I, I think the point that you make about disinformation, you've provided some very helpful links uh, to everyone who can't access it. Please look at your you know, Q&A window. She's provided some very helpful links that add to the conversation. And she's picked up the point about disinformation. Unfortunately, Diet Hassan is, is, is not uh, part of the panel today, but they've been doing some great work in CDD on disinformation in, in uh, uh, Nigeria. And I think we've managed to answer uh, most of the questions here. I'll just see if there is anything open left um, here in, in the Q&A. Mm, uh, I don't think we can see Claudia's links and questions. One sec. So that's from Kathy. Kathy says she can't see Claudia's links and questions. Um, not sure Claudia has provided any links. It's, it's Florencia. Uh, who's provided us the links. Claudia's questions are all now in the tab called answered in your Q&A panel. We've got open, answered, and dismissed. There are seven questions answered and four open. Uh, and if I've missed anything, just, just drop something in, into the Q&A. Can we see? Yeah, Kathy, her, her links are all there in the Q&A tab. If you just look for uh, the open tab, that's I think exactly where it is. If you can't see it, we can, you know, we can uh, paste it and put it on the uh, uh, Q and A for you. But uh, they're all there in in the Q and A tab under open. So she's got, yeah. There you go, Duncan Stanley. Thank you so much. Multitasking is 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 never a good thing when you're moderating. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that we are close to closing time, and uh, whether uh, the panelists want to make very very quick closing interventions, and then I will wrap up at exactly some time left for, for 2 p.m. Panelists, any closing interventions? Lots of food for thought. None, none for me, like you say, lots and lots of things to think about and lots of notes. So thanks to everyone. Um, I'm going down, down the list. Nick, Karen, Lena. Um, nothing, nothing from me. Um, just thank you so much for this conversation. Um, there are lots of things to take into consideration when we're messaging, but I think um, just the top of the line point that uh, Karen made about localized messages of corruption apply across different contexts and they apply when, when we take into consideration um, factors such as um, religion. We didn't talk about gender, which is something I should have perhaps mentioned um, that the types of messages you should uh, um, deploy in a context where you have really, really uh, complex gender norms and, uh, and, and, gender e and, and quite high levels of gender inequality would be really different because of the kinds of social costs that women take on. So just this localized and just context specific messaging uh, uh, um, approach is one that I think we are quite unanimous on. So thank you so much for all of your work. Thanks, Lena. Karen, any closing thoughts? Uh, just thank you uh, for organizing this. It's it's clear and, and it's great to walk away from it with lots of sort of new energy around a potential new research avenues. Um, so thanks. Thanks. Nick? Uh, just to say, you know, on that point that we've all been making about kind of comparability and increasing the cases, I think, you know, collaboration is great and that can be formal collaboration and coalition building, as some people have been pointing out in the Q&A. Thanks for all those excellent comments and questions. It can also be, though, you know, making sure that we read each other's work and we try and replicate and build on each other's work. So, 
you know, Karen and I have tried to use questions that are not too far off the questions she's used in the past. If other people come along and do similar studies and draw on some of those questions, you know, we can start to build up, you know, essentially comparative research without actually doing a whole comparative project by making sure that we're, we're kind of building on and testing the phrases and the ideas and the messages that have worked in the past or haven't worked in the past. And if we keep doing that iteratively, we will hopefully hit upon things that, you know, work better. Um, but if we do it sort of collaboratively taking care to, to test each other's questions in different contexts and to build on what's been done before that's probably the most effective way to do that so uh, in that regard uh, thank you very much Palavi and Duncan and everyone at ACE for organizing this uh, excellent research seminar because I think it will help us to do exactly that and to coordinate and just to encourage people who are listening and interested in collaborating please to to get in touch with us as the speakers and to you uh, to keep the conversation going thanks very much Thank you. I missed a question from Ambika, who says, uh, uh, do you have, uh, oh, Ambika, sorry, do you have examples of who can be brought together? Maybe somebody can, uh, you know, type that in as to, yeah, of how influencers were brought internationally into a campaign without it feeling forced or manipulative. Maybe this was for Kathy, but I, um, uh, you know, just, just taking on uh, some extra leverage because one is the moderator, would, would sort of like to round off today's discussion. I have to say, you know, Nick and Karen's uh, research was one of the uh, earliest bits of research that we began with in ACE. I think Nick and Karen were, were uh, this research was part of the absolutely initial sort of bid that we had made uh, when when ACE was just starting out, and uh, uh, it, it is not the kind of uh, research that SOAS ACE does traditionally. SOAS ACE is sectoral. It, it's about uh, what we would call the productive sectors. It's it's uh, it's much more to do with how how does the electricity sector operate? How do we how do we design fertilizer subsidies? So in a sense, if I might lapse into technical talk for a second. Um, this is this is much more supply side, which is how do we increase effectiveness? It's almost developmental anti-corruption because if we get electricity producers to produce cheaper electricity, better quality electricity and provide electricity to everyone uh, of a standard and, and at a cheaper tariffs, we've not only reduced corruption, we've actually uh, produced a better growth outcome. So, you know, that if you if you have, in a sense, is, is sort of the business case for SOAS ACE. Uh, so what we're really looking for, uh, and, and maybe it kind of got mixed, missed when I was beginning, but we're really looking for actors within sectors. And this is why we work with sectoral data. This speaks to your point, Nick, about the fact that we don't have big data yet in developing countries. So we actually find it easier to work uh, with sectoral data and you know you, you can take care of the confounding variables that you don't find at national level data and we can experiment so some of our approaches have been very very experimental whether it's been in the electricity sector in bangladesh and nigeria or in the skills training sector in, in bangladesh so we also have these very experimental approaches to generate evidence and how do we do do that we, we really go deep into uh, what the sector looks like what be, the behavior of various actors in the, in the in the sector basically looks like and we try and find people who are corrupt who are sorry who are not corrupt but in their self-interest so these are people who are in the sector where you have corrupt people and these are people who are not corrupt because it, for them it doesn't pay to be corrupt they, they are profitable they are delivering a service they're producing a good without being corrupt. And for us, the task is to find out, well, how does that happen? How is it that they are behaving differently when everybody else is behaving differently? And then we pose the feasibility question. Well, they're doing something which makes it feasible to be not corrupt. And then the experiment is in designing policy uh, that way, using that, that as a sort of, uh, of template that can be replicated for others in the sector. And then this becomes our suggestion for feasibility. And I think where the complementarity is with the conversation that we were having with, with the how to message effectively is to then target messaging and devise messaging, which actually targets these policy measures to reinforce these policy measures. And I think that comes across as a very unique anti-corruption developmental package that there are these sort of supply side issues where you are increasing productivity, you're increasing service delivery, and you're reinforcing them with very targeted specific uh, uh, delivery of messages, because these are your non pessimists in a way, people who are behaving in a rule following manner in a sector which is actually corrupt. Well, these are the non pessimists that we've already identified. So I think there are some very unique complementarities here. So it would be absolutely great 
for, for the, sort of the two bodies of research to talk together. And I'm, I'm really glad that we got this, this project in, this really great work that Nick and uh, Karen have done uh, to talk to the other kind of work that SOSS is doing. And then of course, it, it also, as, as Heather says, adds to what SOC, SOC, ACE is now doing. So, so I'm going to end here. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of how the complementarities can actually end up in making research, anti-corruption research, even more effective. And you know, th this is one way of reducing that corruption fatigue. You're actually designing research built on something that's already working. You're replicating it, and then you're reinforcing it with targeted uh, uh, messages. And I think this is really one good way of reducing that, that, that sort of despair and, and, and fatigue. And maybe we can have much more complimentary work going forward. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone for all the questions and, and the interaction that's happened. It's been a long session, but it's been extremely rewarding. Thank you once again, and have a very good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And, and do keep in touch. Uh, Duncan's been tweeting out all the links, all the Twitter handles, uh, all the websites are there. Heather's website is going to be launched soon. Uh, absolutely do access it and, and keep this conversation going. Thank you.